<laughs> Eric and I were just playing on um, Super Mario All Stars, which has updated graphics and sound for everything. And they changed everything. Like they gave Mario his what his outfit that we're used to seeing, which is the blue overalls and the red shirt, um, which is. We were griping about how the updated graphics for this game have made it lose some of the charm, but also I think it that like the the red and green switch to blue and red that's a change that I am here for and I'm glad they did that one. You're biased because you're red green color blind. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not wrong. There's a certain amount of finagling that the graphics can and should undergo, especially when they're upgrading from, like, the original Nintendo to the Super Nintendo. We've already been talking about graphics a little bit, but that's the next big category. And basically, we, we gave everything 5 out of 5, both of us, for every possible little subcategory in graphics. And I think the main thing is that this, this game, like especially remembering back to what it's actually like on the NES, does everything that it should with the available hardware and we can't really expect much more, and it's delightful and charming with what it is. It's actually, I always thought, visually and sound-wise, it was kind of, either the whole, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, because the, there, there are graphic images in this that, again, are so iconic and so part of this universe, but they're also very good functionally in the space, and, and they, all, they all work together in this sort of visually appealing way. All right, another thing that we gave all fives out of five to across the board is the design. But we've also been talking about a lot of this stuff already. Yeah, a lot like, of that is, goes down with the world and, yeah. you know, the sort of boards and the backgrounds and things like that that we've talked about. But all of them very visually cohesive and well done. Yeah, and, and just super fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we can talk about the sound and the music. And again, we gave it all fives all the way down. So I, I teach music theory at the college level. I have, have as many of my classes write papers as I can fit it into the curriculum, just because I think writing is a really good thing for anyone to do in any class. Mm -hmm. And one of the papers that I had my freshman do last year was um, talking about music in other media, and I had them just pick anything, like a scene from a movie, from a video game, a commercial, uh, from a TV show, anything, that is primarily some other media that the music is supporting in some way and talk about what the music adds to what were you there to experience. And one of my freshmen from last year who was probably born in like 99, 2000... Oh, please don't say that. ...wrote about Ugh. the Mario thing from Mario 1. And it's like this... It's so iconic that even if this person had never actually played that game, yeah. You know the theme. You can picture what's going on when you hear that theme. Mm -hmm. It's it's just so perfectly done with what you can do with that hardware. Even the theme itself, you hear this like, doot, doot, doot. It's like he's jumping down the little stairway. Yeah. Doot, 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 doot. <laughs> he's dodging all these different characters. You can see him moving around in your mind's eye just from taking a moment to think about that. That theme and what it's doing. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that before, but I really like that. That's cute. Yeah. And um, it gives you a sort of visual reference that even just hearing the theme and not seeing anything from the game, you can you can picture it and revisit it all in your mind. Yeah, yeah. And even like the quality of the instruments with the 8-bit audio, it's still like everything was really expertly chosen. So the thing I like about this, and I've listened to podcasts and done reading on this before, is the way that they had to put this into the game, they only have three channels of sound to work with. And this is a pretty dynamic theme. It does a lot of work. And so what happened was, like, and also you hear that those three channels have to include the sound effects from within the game themselves. You listen to the theme, and then you notice that when there's a sound effect, two of the channels drop out. It's only the lowest one that they keep if you're hitting a coin or, or striking an enemy or, or falling into the well. Or just jumping. Yeah, they, there is a 
there is a channel that stays with you, but there's the other two channels that cut out just long enough to have that sound effect. And then it comes back in, and the, and the sophistication of that is brilliantly well done. But they were also managing to get a lot of harmonic context in this entire theme just by being able to play around with these three channels. Yeah. Anything else about sound or music or the sound of music? I don't know. The The world of Mario is incomplete without the kind of unique sound effects that we have. Like, just that bing that you get when you get a coin. Yeah. Like, that just, it just, it makes your heart kind of jump a little bit because it's, it's special. For Mario, the sound effects are just as iconic as the theme song and the look of the entire game. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to gameplay. Um... Again, all fives in every subcategory of gameplay for both of us. Um, even though, like, the battles are just, I jump on its head, or I don't jump on its head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was asking Erica for her scores on this while she was playing the game. And, um, <laughs> and uh, there's a subcategory of battles, which is... A, explaining the different types of battles, if applicable, and she, she said negative fifty at the moment. Maybe you should ask me when I'm not stressed or whatever. Like when I'm not playing. Yeah. yeah, ask me that when I'm not sitting here trying to beat Bowser for the umpty millionth time. <laughs> One nice thing about platformers versus RPGs, like I've talked enough about how I mostly only play RPGs and I love them, but. One thing that's nice about platformers versus RPGs is that you're not, you don't have to grind to build up your characters. You have to practice to build up your skill. And if you got skilled enough, you can pick up the game and start at the beginning and breeze through. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about going through all the time of leveling up your characters again, which is, which is nice. Which, by the way, for you young kids watching this, that's going to go away if you don't practice. So go practice <laughs> yeah. and keep up those skills because you will lose them. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, I used to be so good at this game. <laughs> Another really nice thing about the gameplay in Mario 1 is you don't ever really have to worry about the camera messing up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a thing that's, that can be really frustrating, especially in 3D games. Camera where, lag. Or, or just like not being able to get the camera into a place so you can see what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in a, in a side-scrolling game that in which Mario stays in the middle of the frame almost the entire time. You know, I see one of your notes about a learning curve. And I, that makes me instantly kind of curious about what, what would the learning curve be like for somebody playing this for the first time in their early 30s? <laughs> um, you know, I can think of a handful of my friends that have never played video games, and I wanna, I wonder what it would be like to put this in front of them, and, and we literally learned how to play video games on this platform. Like, what would it be like to teach somebody to play fresh on something that is now, you know, significantly old? Right. And to teach them to play video games for the first time with this. Game design and gameplay is meant to teach you how to play as you go. And the best game design does that very well. Mm -hmm. When you get into things that are more complex, any game that's 3D, where you have to figure out a storyline, the gameplay itself and the smacking you over the head with, with directions and push this button here and this is why you do that, there's been a huge increase in the yeah, I get it factor mm -hmm. over the years because of gaming becoming more mainstream and feeling like they have to dumb down the gameplay a little bit. In a lot of ways, I think that's kind of nice because I, I was um, listening to something on NPR recently about um, game developing, game developers working with people with certain disabilities in mind. Mm. Like people who maybe don't see as well or don't hear as well or have different cognitive um, reasons for certain gameplay mechanics being difficult. Game designers in general, still not really enough, but in general are working harder to be more accessible to all players. Like even things as simple as like, we were talking about how I'm red green color deficient and like, Things as simple as being able to switch around the colors. Like sometimes when I'm playing a puzzle game, mm -hmm. um, I can't tell yellow and green apart. The, the ability to change 
colors around, or if there's also a shape involved with the color. You know, things like that that we can eat fairly easily do to accommodate more people. There's a little bit of that with, like, do you want to play easy, medium, or hard, or yeah. impossible, you know? Yeah. But that's that's more about technical skill. Any little thing that there's more adaptability in gaming. Yeah, and that, that, that's another thing that uh, this designer was saying that she really likes it when people do, is when a game has the ability to change what button does what mm -hmm. in, in the in the in the options menu that can really help with accessibility for some people. So that was a little bit of a tangent, but it was a nice one. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> um, any okay? So so now before we go into final thoughts, let's go through the scores that we gave the game. My heart score, what I gave the game, just what I thought it deserved off the top of my head, I gave it a ninety. I gave it a hundred. Yeah, <laughs> and so so with our ninety and our one hundred plus the average of our by the scores game. So the average of our by the scores score is ninety three. Uh, but then averaging Erica's one hundred percent, my ninety percent, and our scores ninety three percent. This game overall has a ninety four percent. I think that's accurate. I think so too. Not quite perfect, but. That's just about as close to perfect as you can get. Yeah, I, I, and Ramin and I were talking about this, and we don't really think that any game that we review is going to get a perfect score. Because it shouldn't. Everything can be better. Yeah. Well, I think we'll have Erica back on for all the other Mario games. Yay, sequel! <laughs> okay, so now any final thoughts about Mario 1? You know, this was never the one that I was best at, but it's always the one that I it was like an aspiration point for me. Like, I want to kick butt at this game. And I, you know, I beat it, and I learned to play on this game, so it it has a lot of meaning for me. There's different things that you go for from each of these three primary games. Mm -hmm. And for this one, you go back for the original, the good-hearted Mario. This is the standard, and this set the standard for most of gameplay for the rest of time, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there are other big revolutionary games that happen in different genres, mm -hmm. but as platformers go, Mario is the standard. I guess I L. Yeah, and I guess I L. Yeah, and I guess I L. Can we cut this out? Yeah, we'll cut this. <laughs> <laughs>